interestingly, the, the benefits have been bigger for maternal use. And, and I say interesting because the program was never designed for maternals. Um, Lifetime Wall, the project, which I'm sure again some of you'd be aware of, um, was was you know merino based, and the recommendations coming out of that were were, were for merinos. Um, but obviously, there's been some principles there that that that, that have been um, uh, adopted by industry. So on on that um, about 9.4 or 9.6, I think uh, percent increase in in marking rates out of maternal producers versus about six for merino producers. I guess why the project came about is, is that in, in some quarters at least, and, and fair enough, there was a lack of confidence in the in the merino-based guidelines, and I guess to go with that, a lack of knowledge on how they should be adjusted. Indeed, we did a we we went to um, uh, 30 to I can't remember exact detail th between 30 and 50, um, you know, leading farmers and, and consultants. And 50% said they were using the, guide, the Reno guidelines, and 50% said they were making their own adjustments. What we also found from that process was wide variation in condition score targets being advised to producers. So if you pick joining time, you know, mid-pregnancy lambing, um, autumn lambing, spring lambing, etc., there was about a 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 variation in each of those points throughout the reproductive cycle. The advice going out to industry for each of those points varied in terms of condition score targets by typically 0.7 of a condition score, which is which is obviously fairly big. I guess what the producers also said from that process was that they were most keen um, on um, condition score targets to to optimise profits. So that's where we're heading. So how, how have we gone about it? Um, so there's been two major research uh, projects or, 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 or experiments, and they were done at four research sites. Um, so Hamilton, PVI in, in Hamilton, um, Tim Leeming's at Pigeon Ponds, just, just near, near north, of, north of Hamilton, uh, the, the South Australian or Saudi research site at Struan, and also um, David and Lynn Slades at, um, at Mount Barker over here in the west. Three of those sites had maternal composites, um, and in one of the two years, the, the South Australian site also compared border Leicester Merino um, versus straight Merinos. Just a little bit of, we don't need or have time to go into all the detail on the experiments and probably don't need it anyway, but, but essentially they were set up to achieve a whole range in live weight profiles, condition score profiles through pregnancy. So the first of the experiments, um, somewhere between seven and 800 ewes at each of the sites were managed to achieve a condition scores varying from 2.4 to 3.6. Um, they were, they were then, the flocks were combined basically once the last lamb was born, the average age of lambs is about 10 days, and, and, and we, we did various measurements which I'll come to around that. The second experiment differed a little. We, we created again a, a, a reasonable range in condition scores at around day 135, 140 of pregnancy, and then um, used from each of those, I guess, fats and skinnies, they went on to a range of food levels or feed on offer levels. And, and again, I'll come back and explain a little bit more about that um, as we go through. So I made the point, I mean, there was there's somewhere between four and 5,000 ewes involved in, in essentially eight experiments. So two years, four sites by two years. So four or 5,000 ewes, six or 7,000 lambs. Um, so, so I guess some, some reason, reasonable numbers um, behind that. As, as you may, or as we still found out, even with those sorts of numbers, everything's not always crystal clear. Just the, the, the um, I guess the model we're working to, and, and some would be familiar with lifetime wool and lifetime new management, it's essentially the same. Uh, it, we were generate, using these live weight profiles to, to measure the effects of, of live weight profile on lamb birth weight survival, uh, ewe survival, lamb growth, ewe reproduction, and so on. And then, I mean, obviously, there's lots of trade-offs going on here. The only way then is to use economic modelling to, I guess, work out ultimately what what um, the optimum system is in terms of dollars per hectare. So how do we how do we manage these trade-offs in, de in different traits, but also obviously trying to maximise or optimise past utilisation stocking rates, you know, which we know are the major profit drivers. So I guess that's the that's the concept. A lot of data collection, which I'll go through uh, tonight. Um, and then, then it goes through some, some fairly robust modelling to, to hopefully 
um, generate uh, condition score targets that will make more money. The, um, so the, in the first experiment, and I'll talk most, mostly about that one tonight, um, we, we, we did reasonably well in terms of achieving those, that diversity, I guess, in, in condition scores at Lamming. So you can see there, hopefully on your screen now, about 2.6 to, to 3.7. So, you know, 15 plus kilos in, um, in, in, uh, in new live weight. Um, some of the observations. Um, twins were typically, um, you know, around 0.2 of a condition score uh, uh, skinnier, thinner than singles at lambing. So when they run together, um, twins are twins are going to be a little bit lighter. And I guess the, the relevance of that, I guess, is when I come come again later, we're probably recommending that they 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 should be about half a condition score fatter. That is, twins um, should be about half a condition score fatter, and yet if you run them together, they they turn out a little bit skinnier. Um, Border Leicester Merino, so this just the one site, as I said, so one experiment out of the eight, um, were, as, as many of you, you uh, know from your own experiences, were about 0.3 of a condition score fatter at Lambing than, than, than Merino's at that, that South Australian site. This project was actually not set up to generate, um, work, I guess, feed on offer targets. You know, how much feed do we need to, 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 to achieve live weight maintenance, to achieve maximum maximum growth or, or whatever it may be. And I say that because all our effort was to generate these condition scores at the top of your slide there. And, and that may have been achieved also, also by supplementary feeding. So in, at many of the sites or, or many of the treatments, often there were, we were manipulating grazing pressure, um, but, but also, also confusing the story, you might say, by adding various amount of supplements. Nevertheless, we were still able to get some insights as to what what the food targets may be, or at least what maternals are doing on different uh, different food levels. And it appeared that, that maintenance, I'm talking about late pregnancy here, day 130 to wave 140, um, we had certainly had use across all the sites, um, you know, maintaining weight and condition in that, you know, four to six, four to 700 kilo range. And, and I know there has been an opinion out there in industry or views that, that you know, sheep are doing much better than maybe what some of the um, uh, extension programs may have been pushing, and that's and that's and I'll, again I'll come back to that. But they certainly seem to be performing well um, under under what we thought were very low uh, food levels, and at the same time they seem to be gaining condition on on sub 1,000. So eight, late pregnancy, 800 to 1,000 kilos, um, twin bearing maternal ewes were, were were often gaining gaining weight. That brings me to, to this about food targets and the, the need to, to let the sheep talk. And I, I, what I mean by that is that food, food targets have always only been a guide. Um, but maybe it is time that we do need to revisit these targets and, and the feed budget tables that I'm, I'm sure many of you would have used through, through Lifetime U and other programs. What we're looking at here is, is feed on offer. And, and in this case, it's, it's, it is defined as all above ground green, you know, uh, green material. Um, I know there are variations on, on, on how we define foo across the country. Um, and the green line there is, is I guess, the, the feed, from the feed budget tables in, in, uh, in the LTEM program. The, the, the middle line is there was an adjustment to that um, for what we call the break of season feed budget tables in WA, where we recognise that a lot of pastures coming out of crops, especially, uh, um, you know, low density um, and, I guess, much taller um, for a given food level, so therefore more accessible. And so again, that, you know, so if you take 500 kgs, um, you can see that the prediction was higher intake. The, the lifetime maternals is, is actually very recent work. It's, it's, it's what we call lifetime maternals phase two, and this is from our, our colleagues in South Australia, who have actually gone and measured as best we possibly can with current technologies, um, actual, actual intake. And it really does confirm, uh, we believe that intakes are far higher than than we have previously thought, and particularly in that in that low food range. And I think that that's certainly going to again have implications as we as we go into um, developing better guidelines and so forth coming out of this project. What are some of the results? Um, uh, there were fairly predictable effects of, of manipulating new live weight um, on lamb birth weights. Now, whether that was ewe live weight change in, in early pregnancy or, or late, you know, typically we see about a 
three to five hundred gram change in the lamb birth weight um, for a ten kilogram change in in the live weight of the mother, and that's very similar to what we saw in merinos. Um, in in fact, it's almost identical, and also the responses are the same whether they were singles, twins, or indeed triples. So we can we can we can manipulate uh, lamb birth weights by something in the order of a uh, half a kilo. What about survival? I mean, this is this is, is reasonably interesting. We've got some differences here to what we may um, have expected, certainly from our merino experience, and that's my background. But but twins and singles effectively have the same birth weight survival response. Okay, they they fit on the same curve. Um, what we, you know, more, more, you know, I guess mortality rates or a higher survival lower in twins, simply because they are lighter. Okay. Whereas in merinos, even if twins and singles are at the same weight, more twins um, die. Okay, so you would normally, if, I, if this was merino data, you'd see two separate curves there. Whereas with maternals, it's just a common curve, um, and live weight is explaining the differences. Big lambs, as we as we all know, you know, um, about six kilo average. So across our our you know six thousand lambs, of, so maybe that was two thousand singles. Um, you know, about six kilo average for singles, about five kilo for twins, um, but a fair bit of, of variation around that um, as, as well. <clears throat> what we do see in the twins, um, despite the five kilo average, we can, I think, think a critical weight here is around four and a half kilos, um, and we can still see on average about 30% of twin lambs um, getting down below that, uh, you know, 4.5 kilos or, or, or about seven and a half percent of mature weight. Um, and where where mortality um, can increase or does increase. Getting to a bit of what it means, and, and I'm conscious that most of you will be, will, will be well into the lambing um, at this point, so it's more up the sleeve for next year. Um, you condition score and lamb survival, the, the responses, well, let's go least for twins, were not entirely different to, to, to again, what we had seen um, in, the, in the past with merinos. So, you know, looking after the twin maternal ewe is, is just as important, okay? And so what, if, so the green line on the, on the bottom there, um, if we were to move a, a, a twin bearing ewe or a, or a mob of twin bearing ewes um, from a condition score of around 2.7 to 3.3, to you, you picked up about 8% survival or 16% or weaning rate from your twin twin ewes, okay? So that's, that's, that's again, as I said, um, not not a whole lot different from um, what we see in in the merinos. The merino response might be just a bit bit, bit more, of course. There was a different story in the singles, um, and and that is the penalty or the or the or the decline in survival um, at at the at the uh, I guess the, the condition score three point five and above. Okay, so the, indeed the lowest survival um, was was achieved in our in the fattest ewes. And again, you may say that's not entirely surprising. Um, you know, as we, we result lead to dystopia and 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 uh, and new deaths as well, which of course. So from that, I mean, we're concluding that you know it would it would certainly seem that pregnancy scanning and differential management of maternal use is is just as important, um, if not more important, um, in in maternals than than merinos. Um, and we don't have the definitive economic based guidelines at this point, but. But my hunch at this point is is that uh, condition score about 3.3 for twins. Um, that is because that curve, that green line, does flatten out. Okay, but you know it's not going to be the most efficient use of pasture either to have really fat ewes and and um, and maybe feet problems become more prominent and so forth. So we're saying about 3.3 for for for, um, for twins until um, I guess the economic modelling uh, convinces us otherwise. And around 2.8 um, for for singles, and I know there is a major report that's been released lately on this project, and it'll be I'd refer you, or encourage you to go and have a read if you haven't. Um, you might just need a, a fair bit of spare time. Um, but there, I have had some comments that I'm recommending 2.5, 2.6 for, for for singles. That's not the case. I mean, certainly there was no adverse effect on survival um, when even down at 2.5 in in singles. But I think other things do come into play, um, so I guess that's why I'm a little bit cautious at this point in time that that you know we should be recommending going down there. So I'm quite comfortable 
to think at this point, again, until convinced otherwise that, that you know, score 2.8 or thereabouts is, is where we should be for our singles. So 3.3 for twins, um, 2.8 or so for singles, so about that half a condition score difference. That, that work really begged a couple of questions. And it was one of them, I think, was can high food levels during or high feed on offer levels during very late pregnancy and, and lambing compensate for poor nutrition, I guess, through pregnancy and low low condition score at lambing. So a bit of a mouthful there, but you know, I guess the you know in in reality, you know, is it is it worthwhile running the ewes a bit harder, you know, building the feed wedge as you do, um, and then letting them letting them into it, um, you know, with a couple of weeks uh, pre pre lambing, would that I guess would that overcome the the expected negative effects of having in your twins I'm talking about of of having uh, lower condition and we could see you know in theory you could see benefits in lamb birth weights um, but also improvements in survival independent of birth weight which is what we saw in the merinos um, presumably higher feed levels there regardless of birth weight um, the ewe will start at the birth site longer and we we know that that's good for, for maternal bonding and, and lamb survival. I guess the second question comes back to that 2.6 versus 2.8 thing, and it's really about how hard can we run singles, um, given you know there is no apparent uh, negative or adverse effects on lamb survival, even down to 2.5, 2.6, and I guess in in maternals we're less worried about the impacts on on wool production from both the progeny and and the ewe, and again for those that have done lifetime ewe management or heard the story. You know, we know that if we run merinos hard, um, those progeny are going to produce less less wool and broader wool throughout their life, and and that that fact is part of the reasoning why um, I guess you know that even with single merino ewes, we need to look after them a bit better. Unfortunately, um, the, a, a second experiment was not didn't shed a whole lot of light on that first first question. Well, what we did is. We, we, we had it, it was useful in other respects, but not this one. We so uh, two weeks prior to lambing, um, basically we had these fat and skinny ewes, as I said before, who went on to, to food levels from 800 even down to 600, um, up to 2,000. And the effects of ewe live weight profile during pregnancy on birth weight were similar to the first first experiment, but there was basically no effects of food. Um, I've got to speed up a little bit, but in this particular experiment, you know, birth weights were quite big. Um, five kilos for twins, as I said, and, and six plus for singles. Survival rates were very high. And I guess what I'm left to conclude from that is that there was really no clear evidence that late pregnancy food can or can't compensate for low um, pre-lambing um, condition score. So we're a little bit uh, hanging in that respect. I mean, because I know some producers were certainly also asking that question of whether they could run their use hard or a bit harder. Um, save the feed and then put them on um, just prior to lambing. But we're from this work, at least at this point, we don't really have a clear conclusion on that. What about the second point about how, I guess, how hard can we run, um, you know, singles? Um, and this, this other things come into play here around ewe mortality, lamb growth rates to weaning and ewe recovery um, and, and carryover repro. So I guess that, that's, that's some things we need to consider as well. What we found in terms of ewe live weight and lamb growth, again, a very, very similar story to, to, to birth weights, which I showed you earlier, and a very, very similar story to, to uh, the maternal, uh, sorry, the merino story. So predictable impacts of, of manipulating ewe live weight through pregnancy on, on lamb growth um, and weaning weights. And about, well, let's just say a, a one to two kilo change in weaning weight um, for a 10 kilo change in, in ewe live weight uh, at some stage through pregnancy. So not, not massive. <coughs> Single and twins responded the same, um, as I said, as, as we saw before. A few, a few graphs here, which I, I, um, I wish I had more time and I'm conscious I'm running out of it already. Um, but it's, it, they're looking at the effects of, 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 of various factors on, on lamb growth and then ewe recovery. And it's, I was really toying with how to present it because we've got, we, we, there's a clear effect of feed on offer and we would expect that. Um, but there's also effects of the condition score at the ewe, of the ewe at lambing. Um, there's effects of whether she's got a single or twin on her. And, obviously, and there's also a fairly significant effect of proportion of clover in the pasture. All, all things we might expect, but reasonably challenging to present. 
what, what, I've, what I've got here is, I guess, the conclusions here is that, is that um, feed on offer largely does drive land growth rates. Um, and, um, you know, to maximise land growth rate, you know, we're looking up around 2,000 kilos uh, or two tonnes per hectare. I think probably more important than that is about 95% of the maximum can be achieved at 1,500. So, you know, and, and even 85% at 1,000. But, but so I think it's, it's everyone, no, well, in every year you're not going to have two tonne. I guess I'm conscious of that. And so the idea of presenting this is, is, is really to, to put, plug your own figures in there and get some feel of what, of what that, I guess, the, the penalty may be, let's say, or the percent decline if you're not up in where feed's available ad lib. So food's the main one. Um, condition score at lambing, a reasonably small effect. I've already alluded to that in the previous slide here. You can see the difference between the red line and the green line. So this is used that was scored 2.5 or 3.5 at lambing. Um, there's only a 20 gram per day difference in, in the growth of their lambs. Okay, um, so not so so not huge. And before I move on, I guess you know just to the, the, the point about clover percent, we also found that a, that a, about you know an extra 20 percent clover in the pasture, not trivial also increase land growth rates by about, by about 20 grams per day. <clears throat> Ewe recovery, um, again, just as, as com just as complex and, you know, I'll, I'll leave my details later and, and if anyone does want to follow up, I'd be more than happy to, to do that. Um, it's just hard to, to get it down here. But same factors, again, influence whether, you know, how, how the ewe is going to rebound for next year. Um, so here we're looking at, at, I guess, the effects of feed on offer. On, on compensation up to, to weaning time. And I guess, and again, for the three um, condition score examples. So those, you know, our skinny ewes just have huge capacity to rebound. Um, and, and, and again, in this case, you can see that um, the score 2.5 ewes, so the red line, you know, they would they would maintain that um, through, through I, sh I should add, this is for ewes rearing twins. Um, so the twin bearing used in 2.5 at lambing would maintain 2.5 through to weaning if they were about a ton. Um, those that were scored three at lambing would maintain at about 1,500 and, and, and so on. Um, so again, we can use this this to, to to provide some insights into how how we should be uh, or the targets we should have through lactation. Um, basically, a, 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 a ewe she was only rearing a single. Um, and maybe if there was a bit more clover in the pasture, you know, these, these ewes that are 2.5 at, at lambing time can be, can be 3.5 at weaning. They can, they can rebound a whole condition score through, through the lactation period. My, my summary of this slide is that the difference is in, generally, the differences in live weight um, or condition score at lambing halve by weaning. So if we've got groups of animals that are about a condition score different at lambing, they'll be about half a condition score different um, come, come weaning time. And that's a pretty similar story for, I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to get the wrap up in a second, um, for post weaning as well. Again, I'll, I'll have to skip through this, but we also see those skinny ewes um, recovering significantly from, from, from weaning time onwards. And, and again, any difference we have at weaning time actually halved by, by, um, by the following joining. I need to go to reproduction. I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up um, in, a, in, a, in two minutes if I can. Um, reproduction was an interesting one. So what the story I've been trying to paint there is that the, I guess the, you know there is huge capacity for for ewes that may have uh, maternal ewes that you know may have had a tough season or or or, or not been managed appropriately, or whatever. I mean, if given the given the conditions, they can rebound for next joining. What are the on average? What are the effects of that on 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 repro? Um, at, the, at the next joining, on average, we saw about a 24% increase in, in reproductive rate. So this is, this is fetuses per 100 ewes at scanning um, per condition score. Remembering in these maternal ewes, one condition score was also about 14 kilos, um, quite a little bit different. What we also see is that those that had a twin um, through the, in the previous year, they had about 15% higher reproductive rate if they were given the chance to to, to get back to the, to the same weight. So, so based on this, just to, 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 to wrap up, 
of the in terms of the carryover reproduction that we that we observed in in our in our series of experiments. Um, you can see here in 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 one experiment, two experiments, you know, huge differences in 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 pre-lambing condition score that were almost eliminated by the following joining. As I said, that big capacity to and and drive drive to eat. <clears throat> what I therefore expected, based on the slide I just showed you, is that there would be minimal difference in 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 reproductive rate. But in fact, there was still a residual effect of you know between um, let's say the highs and lows of 14 percent in one year and 11 in the other. So the effects of poor nutrition during pregnancy and lactation on carryover reproduction were actually greater than what we expected based on condition score alone. And from that, we've also been able to now, um, I guess, uncover that it's the live weight profile as well, or it appears to be the live weight profile over the prior 12 months, which also has an effect on reproduction rate at, um, regardless of, of her scanning uh, weight. What I'm saying there is that even if you get them back to the same point, they could would still differ by up to 10% in reproductive rate depending on how they got there. And it just so happens that the most important period by far is the prior pregnancy. Okay, so use that that lost the heap of weight through the prior pregnancy and then gain that weight, say, post weaning, they could still have, be, have their reproductive performance uh, compromised by up to 10% depending on when they lost and gained. And I just raised that because I think that's that too is going to come into play when you come back to that, that jigsaw about we know and this this has really been about understanding all these responses to enable us to to I guess model that to come up with the guidelines that will hopefully help you um, in the future so I'll just wrap this up um, so predictable effects of new live weight profile on land birth weights and weaning weights as I said um, benefits of diff from differential management of singles and twins and and my hunch again I'm, I, I could well be proven wrong um, is that the, the benefits could even be greater for maternal use um, than, than merinos. And, and we shouldn't forget that only 20%, 25% of maternals are scanned for multiples. Um, lamb growth, obviously driven by food, um, feed on offer, but, but you know, we should, shouldn't forget the other, other drivers as well, percent legume and condition score at lambing. Low use can compensate you know, hugely, um, you know, given the opportunity to do so. Um, but what we are finding that nevertheless, you know, the effects on carryover reproduction all the same may be greater than even if we do get them back to, to the same uh, condition. Where to next? And I did, I did warn David that, that or this was a, was a work in progress and, and maybe we can come back in 12 months or less. Um, so new nutrition effects on the production of maternal use and their progeny. Uh, or, or does affect the production of maternal use and their progeny, and therefore it's realistic to expect that farm profit will be influenced. And, and I guess that's what we—that's our task now. Right now, we come in, we, we we had a we met a bit of a block 12 months ago, in terms that the models that we used couldn't adequately represent the performance of I guess modern maternal use or maternal use. That is, the the they would do better, they would gain more weight um, than than what was predicted. So we've had to run, you know, thanks to MLA, we've gone back and done some further work and really having understanding the, I guess, the intake capacity of maternals and also their maintenance requirements. Um, and that works complete now. Um, so hopefully in the next um, three to, to, to six months and certainly before the 2019 breeding season, um, we'll be able to, to come out with some, some guidelines that um, will, will help you in, your, in the management of your maternal use next year. That's about it from me, Hilary. Thanks. And sorry, I went a little bit over time. No worries, Andrew. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, great look at what the project has um, done so far. And um, it looks like it's going to be very influential going forward for um, for producers with maternal use. Um, so just quickly, um, we'll give Andrew a little bit of a break. Um, um, and just go over again the next webinar, Tuesday night, 8 p.m. with Bruce Allworth, um, and he's looking at pain relief options for sheep. Um, those who do have to leave now, can you please um, complete the post-webinar survey? Um, these, your answers to the questions are shared with MLA um, and the presenters, um, and this will help improve extension efforts through MLA 
and um, the presenters as well. Um, and as Andrew alluded to, the report for um, this project is out and um, I would encourage everyone to have, it is quite a big read, but it's definitely worth it. Um, has a lot of information that will be very um, useful going forward. So Andrew, are you right to answer some questions now? Yeah, I am. I just, if I could just add that yeah, the report is pretty heavy, and um, but there is also Breadwell Febwell for maternals. So again, many of you would be familiar and may even have been to a pilot that we are, um, you know, developing a more tailored Breadwell Febwell version um, targeted at maternals based on a lot of this information and hopefully that'll start to be rolled out as well. Great. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Okay, so the first one from Charles um, Andrew, he wants to know why Hamilton was the only place where survival had a linear response to live weight in lambs. Was was it the bad weather or a lambing date or can you explain that in some way? Um, I'm, not, I'm not totally, uh, uh, Hamilton certainly had the most adverse weather but I guess what I've presented today, and I hope this answers your question, Charles, is the combined analysis. So, because um, sometimes you, you get odd little results at a single site. So, the the one the, the data I presented there today with the 16% change in 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 wheat marking rate, 8% change in survival, um, includes the Hamilton site and 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 the other sites. Okay, the the response at Hamilton, I'm stretching my memory a little bit, was a little bit steeper than that. Okay, so but the one the one I presented is is the combined analysis. Right. I hope um, that goes some way to answering your question. Let us know if it doesn't, Charles, and um, we can look at it again. Um, or Charles would also like to know. Sorry, Andrew. Um, yes, the pub the paper was published, Charles. You can find it on the MLA website. Can you, Andrew? Is that where you'd find it? Oh, you can. Yep, yep. yep. But and also the I get yeah. That's that's it is a big read, but also the journal papers will be out soon. Um, but as I said, otherwise, Bebel Febel. Great. Um, Frank would like to know: Was there any data relating to the hair breed use, such as Dorpers? Um, not not in this project, Frank. But there was MLA did fund a project um, 2013, 2014. Um, on Dorpers and again a lot of the similar and I've seen all the data a lot of the same sorts of things apply okay but um, Kelly Pierce a colleague or ex-colleague at Murdoch University ran that project but again, you could certainly find that final report as well um, on the MLA website. Great um, this is a good question Andrew from Lou um, they uh, have some composite ewes, 100 days pregnant, 178% scanned in lamb. Um, they're still full drought feeding according to Lifetime U, but can only deliver grain every second day due to logistics. Do you think this is a problem? Could you just, so day 100? Yep, 100 days pregnant and 178% scanned in lamb, composite ewes. Is there an issue with, with, so the questions around feeding frequency? Yeah, feeding frequency, yep. Yep, look, no, if, if, if feeding every second day, absolutely no issue with that. Um, and I, I think the, you know, the, the general practice would be, you know, every, every two or three days. I mean, presumably it does, a, does depend a little bit on what, what you're feeding and what the weather conditions are and so forth, but, but my initial response is no issue with feeding every second day. So this comes, the next question comes from Brett. Um, he would like to know how long should lambs be with the ewes before uh, weaning occurs? <laughs> yeah, great question, Brett. Um, I've been trying to find an answer to that for 30 years. Um, <clears throat> look, look, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not straightforward. But I mean, the fact of life, but, but nevertheless, I mean, if, I mean, I would still say 13 to 14 weeks, but I know a lot of lot of maternal producers would disagree with that. But you know, even at you know beyond 14 weeks, um, even though the lamb is only taking you know 10 or 20, 10 or 15 percent of its diet from the mother, that can still be you know three to five megajoules, depending on she's carrying a single or twin. Okay, so that can that can still translate into 
you know, 50 plus grams a day that the ewe could be regaining if if you took the lamb away. So lot, I mean, lots come into it. I know, know there's there's arguments about, you know, you know, selling them direct off mum and having a higher dressing percent, which is absolutely real. Um, so I guess it's not totally straightforward, Bretons. Yeah, but but I, I would still on balance go for 13 to 14 weeks, particularly in a tough year, um, which many are having. So because it is it is just an extra drag of three three to four megs is not trivial. You know, 300 grams of oats or or, bar, or, or 400, 300 grams of oats. Um, yeah, so that's that's my answer. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Philip would um, like to know the poor nutrition. Um, uh, just lost the question. Um, which suppresses fertility? Um, do, is that represented by a condition score? Um, and then, how long does that suppressive effect go for? Could you just read that again? So um, the. I'll read the question as it as it writes. The yep. poor nutrition which suppresses fertility is represented by what condition score and how long does the suppressive effect go for? Um, I, I guess there's just those two there's just those two key results there in that on average one condition score at, at joining gives an extra 24 fetuses scanned, okay, or a 24% increase in, in, in reproductive rate. Um, but what, and, and that's, that's, that's just for that, that reproductive cycle. What, what we found in this project is that it's not just the condition score she is when the ram hits her, it's actually how she got there over the previous 12 months as well, okay. So if, if, and and just so it turns out that it's the live weight change during the previous pregnancy which has the greatest effect. So if differences in so if, if they are differentially managed during pregnancy, um, and let's say you had a condition score difference at the point of lambing, um, maybe they maintained um, through lactation, but then the the, the skinny group caught up um, post weaning. Okay, so they're actually the same life, same condition at the following joining. You still may get a 10% difference in scanning performance, even though they got to the same weight. Um, you can still get a difference because of how they got there over the over the previous 12 months. I'm I'm not too sure if I've answered the question. Yeah, let us know, well, Philip, if um, you want to look at that one again. Um, Andrew Mark, um, he feeds. Uh, barley and pea mix to his ewes. He would like to know at what stage of pregnancy would you start supplementing the ewes this mix um, if they were on green feed three weeks to go before lambing started. Um, so there's no mention of what foo is is available, but I suppose you might be able to extrapolate that. Yeah. Um, well, my, my initial reaction is if again depends a little bit on what, how much green feed you've got, but but it's highly likely you've got enough protein coming through that. Um, so really, it comes down to, to cents per unit of, of, of me. So it's whether you know depending again depending on the quality of your barley and the quality of your peas. So have them feed tested, um, and then feed whatever's cheaper in terms of cents per per, per megajoule. Great. Thank but I, I don't I don't necessarily think. That it'd be you'd need to be topping up put with your peas for, from a protein point of view because because I'm a little bit short on detail but you you could well be getting enough um, protein from your from your green grass anyway. Yep, definitely. Um, so Charles would like to know. This is a good question. Um, did hybrid vigor play any part in the efficiency of the first cross use? So, for example, would you expect um, significantly different results with a single breed or a stabilized composite? Oh wow, Charles! <laughs> um, I reckon I'm just going to have to say I don't know. Um, it's um. Yeah, look, look, don't, don't know, don't know. But I, th I just think it. So that's that's a bit of a cop out. But I just think um, there's so much diversity in all our sheep these days, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm actually, I actually think that the, the guidelines we have out there for merinos are, are, are out of date. Um, they've done, a, they've done a great job, mind you, but, but not out of date. Do they need fine tuning because we've just got such diversity in, in the merino population? And the same would apply here. 
you know, sheep, maternals ain't maternals, and and merinos ain't merinos. So, you know, how much how much tailoring do we need to do to a certain genotype or a certain ewe type? I'm not too sure. But Charles, I, I actually can't answer your question. Um, but but I would be happy, you know, to to get the details by Hillary and, and try to follow up for you. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, so Kieran um, would like to know: Was there an embryo or fetus loss from scanning to birth when the condition score fell over this period? Um, no, would no, and um, <clears throat> no. Um, I'm just trying to think of the numbers. That the scanning the scanning results in the main were were very well. The, the lambing rounds, because at all all eight sites or eight experiments, um, there was full lambing rounds, of course, to get birth weights, and the data really does match up with with um, with the scanning data very well. Now I might just add that my my colleagues at Murdoch do have a a, a pretty big project in that space now, looking at fetal losses, um, and and it also includes Victoria and South Australia. But what's you know what's the frequency? When's it occurring? What's causing it? Um, how do we manage it and that sort of stuff. So, again, if, if that was a particular interest to Kieran, we could help out. Yeah, great. That sounds really good, Andrew. Um, James would like to know, I guess this could be involved with the program that's being run out now. Do you envisage, envisage that um, there will be a separate table for maternals like there is in Lifetime U for Merinos that tells you how many megajoules of energy needed um, based on preg status, stage of pregnancy, and foo. Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, I think there's a clear need for that now. Okay, but but I mean, it's easy. I'll, I'll get to it in a sec. It's easy to look back. You know that that data I showed you, and, and I was probably responsible 15 years ago for for at least helping develop those lifetime U tools. And you look back now and say, well, gee, were we that wrong? And we actually used the best information at the time. To, to generate that, but now I think we might have had it a bit off. Okay, so so James, I think there is a need, um, particularly with that some of that data I showed you there, where you know intake in those low food levels could be double. Um, but um, it's a big job to do, you know. But I, there is there is there is a number of there is a several projects happening or going to happen around trying to improve. What we call ruminant feeding standards, okay, which is really the say let's say the biology that goes into grass feed. If you're familiar with grass feed, so so that's a, a long way to answer, James. I think it needs to be done. Um, it's a matter of just how rigorously it can be done because it's probably a fairly huge job. <clears throat> yep, great. Um, so next question from Tim Andrew. Um, so we speak a lot about. Um, the latest stages of pregnancy, how important is the rising plane of nutrition or condition score at joining? Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay, so how, well not very important. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, we've never been able to, um, I'll start again, in, in adult use, I, we, I believe the the key determinant is just the weight she's at when she gets hit by the ram. Okay, I don't I don't think I haven't thought it was that important, and I had no evidence to suggest it was that whether she was gaining or losing at that time um, mattered. Okay, but this, as I said, this latest work is suggesting that that profile over the over the previous 12 months, including the post weaning period, is important. But that's over a much much longer period. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Tim. But but I'll try again. Basically, whether she's gaining or losing at the time the ram hits her, I don't think is that important. It is massively important in ewe lambs, but not in adults. Thanks, Andrew. We've just got someone written in to say thank you um, for the work that you've done and looking forward to reading the report. Um, they would love to know more about the heritability or repeatability for multiples in maternals. Um, so if I think Brad's left, but if you do want to get in touch with Andrew, um, please let us know and we can forward you his details if that's right, Andrew. Um, yeah, absolutely. And Hillary, could I just say one thing? Because I, I was, I know I was pushing for time, and I hope I didn't lose everyone. But 
guys, we also have, a, or girls, we also have a new project around triplets. Um, this this first year is, is so MLA funded. Um, we're we're looking for 200 producers nationally. I think we're about 150 at the moment. Um, and this first year is really just baselining information and 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 using industry and your opinions on on practices that you do and don't do to to really inform where the research opportunities are. So if if anyone's online that that um, has an interest in in triplets, again, it'd be great to hear from you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so another question from Charles: um, Did the age of the ewe have any effect? If um, so, for example, if your flock was weighted to either younger or older, um, would the results have been different? Yeah, another, another great question, Charles. Um, I can answer this one. Um, again, it would be in the report there. There was no. There would, there would be what you would call main effects of age. You know, if they were, if they were, you know. Three-year-olds, they had a had a heavier lamb than a two-year-old, for example, but the responses to nutrition were the same. Okay, so there was no um, age by nutrition interaction. If that sort of answers your question, okay. So um, I think yeah. So there there were there were effects of age as we would as we would normally expect. Um, you know, three or four-year-olds milk you know milk milk are fractionally better than six-year-olds or whatever it might be, but generally the responses to nutrition were 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 the same. So, so I don't think I don't think we would get down to that level of precision, excluding maidens or or, or or twenty month olds, in terms of you know two and a half year old and older. I don't believe there would be a need to have different targets for you know let's say two and a half to five and a half year olds. Yep, yep. Um, so from James Andrew, what percentage of protein does a mature you need pre joining if on dry feed? Um, again, I mean, she just she doesn't need too much. I mean, if, if, as distinct from flushing, if it's all about managing live weight, um, you know, eight percent, nine percent, something something of that nature, um, is 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 fine. It's really about energy. If if a if a dry you um, pre joining, um, you know, she needs a critical amount of protein, which is that that eight or nine percent, but she doesn't need any more. It's just about trying to get. If you were trying to gain weight, for example, it's about energy intake rather than protein intake. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the last questions, I think, um, so get them in quickly if you want to hear some more. One from Kieran, um, were there more mineral nutrition problems with use, such as hypercalcemia, mag magnesium, um, really singles versus twins? Yeah, another good question. Kieran, and, and again, I skipped over it in my in my presentation. We just didn't get, unfortunately, we didn't get um, enough U deaths. It sounds sounds wrong, but there weren't enough U deaths to make any robust conclusions regarding, you know, the effects of of, of condition score or or in, in singles, twins, or whatever. So. Um, you know, yes, dystopia was a bigger issue in the in the overfat singles, as you'd expect. But I don't think we had the numbers to to then look at, you know, hypercalcemia or whatever. I, I do add again that in the so so in some respects, U mortality or having good data on U mortality is a gap at the moment. We will we actually are again collecting that information through the triplets project where we will have each of a lot of farms will have will monitor twins and triplets and hopefully collect more data on on um, at least the effects of condition score and I know there's another big MLA project um, up for negotiation that will look more specifically at the causes of death um, in, 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 in use. Yeah, great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so James would like to know, um, do ram, so ram breeders, breeders often say that spiking the protein pre-joining using lupins uh, for two weeks um, pre-joining and interjoining, joining uh, has this flushing been tested to your knowledge, Andrew? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit, I have a slightly different view on this one, James. Um, we we did review, the, or a colleague of mine did review the literature um, some, while, some while ago, so that might make sense, a little while ago, 
and and the average response to lupin so yeah 500 grams from a week before to a week into joining was was something like 12 percent increase in scanning rate um as in fetuses per per hundred used of which many of them don't make it to weaning of course so so the effect was not huge okay um but the effect is highly variable you know even you know it's almost from zero to 40 okay but average is 12 okay so i know and why it's variable i don't know and so it's easy to get into a, a, a debate because i'm absolutely sure flushing does work for some people it doesn't work for a whole lot and on averages it's 12. the other thing about flushing is that we know that skinny use respond better than fat use and and so i just wonder whether it's in the best um, interests of the ewe and her lambs, if we're essentially making ewes that would probably set up to carry a single, we flush them and give them a twin, whether they'll actually be capable of carrying it. So the flushing is very extremely widely adopted, almost the you know, especially from WA here. I mean, obviously the work came out of here years ago, but but um, it, it can be very much hit and miss. Great, thanks Andrew. Um, so one from Charles again, um, in the study that was done, were the critical weights cited on the um, absolute weight or the weights proportionate to the mature body weight? Yeah, um, j yeah, just just weights at this, but, but the when the guidelines come out, um, Charles, yes, they will be they will be expressed in a in a in terms of percent of standard reference weight. Yep, which which is also conditions same thing as condition score essentially. Great, thanks, Andrew. That seems to have pulled up the questions for tonight. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add, Andrew, um, before we let everyone go? Um, no, just look. Thanks for thanks for giving me the the, the evening and and yeah, just probably had a little bit much there to skip through, but um, hopefully you got something from it. So um, just before we, let me just see. Um, thanks everyone again for tuning in. Um, just remember to um, do the um, survey at the end um, as you log off um, and we'll see you next Tuesday night um, at 8 p.m. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we'll see you soon. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.